welcome everybody um, to you know what I think can be quite a useful discussion. Um, my name is Ty Moore. I work with Socialist Alternative, and we're hosting this forum tonight. And I think you know I don't need to say very much about what the, the reason is. Um, people, how many people here were at the rally for Trayvon on Thursday night? So I think a majority of people. So pretty confident that most people have a sense of uh, you know the injustice and that's why you're here so I mean the purpose of this meeting um, was to talk about you know what are the deeper issues behind the violent racist murder of Trayvon Martin and you know and what is the political basis upon which a more sustainable movement can be built how do we make this not just one more flare-up of anger across the country and everybody goes back home and you know, waits for the next incident to, to gain national attention and get people's anger going. And so hopefully, you know, I would encourage, we're going to have a, a panel introduced in a moment, um, but I'd encourage, we want this to be a participatory discussion. And I assume everybody's here because they, they probably have ideas, probably have thoughts on this subject, and so I'd encourage people to, you know, take notes, think through their thoughts as you're here in the panel, and reflect back and op open the space up for a discussion after that. So first we're going to have... Um, Mel Reeves, um, who's a longtime community activist, you know, came to be known, I think, mostly through police brutality, uh, counter-organizing in the 1990s up to the present, um, former editor of the Spokesman Rep Recorder, Northside Publication, um, and we'll uh, start off with him. Well, all right. Thanks, uh, Ty. Um, you know, I'm going to tease you because, you know, I always like to be called a political activist because these days, you know, they confuse it. You remember, I think uh, Obama was a community organizer or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm not a community organizer. I do some community organizing, but so, but I, I feel, you know, community act, but political thing. I do the po political thing, alternative po political thing. Um, I'm going to start off by reading something you all are familiar with. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men... All human beings are created equal. That they're endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now to secure these rights, governments are instituted among human beings and derive their just powers from the consent of the govern governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of and to these ends, it is the right, the obligation of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light and transit causes and accordingly all experience has shown that humankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. You guys know what that's from, right? <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess? Nobody knows what that's from, really? Constitution. Yeah, it's a preamble to your constitution, man. It's part of what's called... Anybody hear the Declaration of Independence? Anybody remember that this country was formed with a, by revolution? Folks, remember, we forget that. You can't forget that, because it wasn't that long ago, actually. It really wasn't, uh, as far as uh, the uh, length of countries um, and nations and, and um, empires. This one isn't that old. Um, and I think it's important that we remind ourselves of that kind of thing. So I started with that because I think ultimately uh, we have to um, we have to make some real changes in this society. I mean, we can't keep pretending uh, that you know things are okay. And, and so I'm kind of starting with the end first on some level because you know I think that's the solution to the Trevor Martin thing. The, the same solution to all of our issues that you know this isn't working. You know, this, you know, the Occupy movement has identified correctly that, you know, we've got some real economic inequality and equity in our society and that we've got to do things differently. You know, we've got to, something has got to give up. Something's got to give, something's got to change. And so with the Trevon Martin thing, 
uh, the Tra Trevon Martin case, I think, highlights the need for change. I think uh, just like, you know, it's like a flash of neon light. You know, I'm trying to keep up my time, too, and I forgot what time I started. I think 7.34, was it? Okay. <laughs> um, if I were to speak on um, the other day, and, and let me say this to folks, too. Uh, I think it's important that uh, when you hear people getting involved, like uh, if an event uh, goes down, or uh, something that, that strikes people's political interests as the Trevon Martin case is done. I think it's very important that people who are political, and I'm assuming, as I recognize some faces in the audience, it's really important that us political people get involved and get in the middle of it and, and have as much of a political message put out there. You know, Nobody sitting at this table spoke at that. Ty was, I don't know if he was here, Rosa was gone, but you know, nobody with the kind of political message that, me, that, that one of the three of us would have put out spoke on, on the other day. I think that was a travesty. That 6,000 people were gathered, and they didn't really hear a political message. And you guys know, and that's not to put anybody down, but there was uh, Ty was talking about how do we go forward. That wasn't presented. How do we tie in a local thing? That wasn't presented. Even encouraging folks to continue to do it. That wasn't even presented, for crying out loud. You know? Um, and so there was some prejudice, of course, people like us, that, you know, and you have to fight for that position because a lot of times people aren't stupid. They understand, like a person like myself or Ty is going to get up and say, ultimately, you know, we got to make some changes and you got to do it. And so they don't necessarily want that message heard, but we have to fight for that thing. In the old days, we understood that. I don't think folks understand that we can't just lay back and let, you know, the, the reformists and the liberals and, you know, the, uh, you know, those other folks um, just get up and just talk willy-nilly. You know, this is serious stuff, and uh, we got to take it serious. In fact, and I have Michelle Alexander's uh, book in front of me, and she has a little chapter where she says, tinkering is for mechanics, <laughs> you know. Not for people fighting for social justice, not for folks who are fighting for change, okay? We're not tinkerers. We, we've got to get in here and actually make some change. These things are opportunities. This is an opportunity. I'm glad you all put it on. Um, and so um, that's important. Um, if I were to talk to uh, people, because most of you guys are already un, uh, political on some level, you have some consciousness, so, you know, I'm not going to, to talk down and talk to folks as <laughs> if you don't know what's going on. But let me put out um, a perspective that I, that I took on, on the Trayvon Martin issue. Um, I talked about, in fact, I put out an editorial. Um, uh, I write a column in the Spokesman Recorder called uh, Melanius, and uh, in my last column, I said, blame the government. I blame the government for what has happened and what continues to happen in the Trayvon Martin case. And the reason I said that was because, as I, as I, that's why I read from the preamble to the Constitution, it's uh, the government's job and role is to protect people, all right, to protect the citizens. And so, and the government has been guilty on some level of allowing black people to be suspect. Let me walk it down a little bit. You know, that the, uh, when slavery kind of became a black thing, uh, it became something that was institutionalized. Remember, before there were indentured servants, slaves were white and black and Indian and what have you. And then when it became easier or expedient to make slaves black, uh, you know, that was a legal sanctioning. Uh, later on, during slavery, uh, we had the fugitive slave laws that were enacted, and that was legal as well. That again branded blacks especially free blacks and suspect because what, what would happen was, was that a slave owner could just run up north and just grab anybody who was black and say it was my slave because it was your verb versus his. A very good point. That's what's happening in this as well. Okay? This is, you've got this, because, and make no mistake, George Zimmerman is a white guy. Okay? Uh, in Florida, uh, the Cubans, the people who call themselves Hispanics, play this out and you have to be living in Florida, Miami, to understand this very well. The Hispanics play this thing out as, they act like white folks. Black people understand that, you know, from, you know, deep in their souls, they understand that, right? So there's a game being played about, well, he's Hispanic, and he's, a, no, no, this is a white guy, okay? That's how they play it there. They act like white folks in the worst, in the worst way you can put that term. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about you guys. I see everybody looking like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, you know, they practice white supremacy is what I'm trying to say, okay? Not all of them, but a lot of them, they, they hold on to the tents very strongly. And uh, so, um, so the suspect thing is, is out there, right? So we're suspects, even as freed uh, black people, as freed sla ex-slaves, we're still suspect. Um, and uh, further on in our history, you get to uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, even the court decisions. Um, Dred Scott escapes slavery, and he's in free states, and, and then he goes, and he goes to the high court of the land. And again, they reinforce his status as a slave by saying what? What? Black folks have no rights to what? 
you guys you got to notice this is important history, by the way. If you need this, the history of the Supreme Court cases involving black folks help you understand why we are where we are. Because in that that case, it said that the Supreme Court said that black folks had no rights that whites were bound to respect. Okay. Then in 1896, with the Plessy versus Ferguson, where Plessy said, "Look, I should be able to sit anywhere on the train, and this and the other," and they said, "No, no, no, no," because uh, you know you, you you're okay. That's where the separate but equal. Again, the whole point is again that you're a suspect. Vagrancy laws were put in effect. Black people were, be, were able to be picked up off the street legally. If a white person could vouch for them, they were put up. You guys have probably seen the movie Neo Slavery by uh, Don, uh, by what's his name, Blackman. You ought to see that if you haven't seen it. PBS has a documentary that talks about uh, this whole process in which people were incarcerated and then they were the lease system and when they were like leased out to corporations and that kind of thing and sometimes worked to death. It was legal. The point again is that. And, and uh, during the early 1900s, NWCP and other groups tried to uh, get the government to institute anti-lynching laws. Again, they refused. Okay, so again, you have this whole suspect narrative running through, right? You've got the suspect. There. So again, black folks are suspect and unprotected. And so you come to the Civil Rights Movement, you know what happened then? The government pretty much had to intervene because it got really crazy at some points. But you notice the government didn't intervene. And so... Uh, the conclusion I draw out of this, because uh, I don't want to take much time anyway, so, um, as I'm not saying anything all that new, is that black folks, and you all have to help black people understand this, and you all have to understand that, that we are full citizens. You know, like I said to some young people, they got each other saying, we're not begging, you know, we're not begging for anything. We are full citizens. And so blacks as full citizens ought to enjoy the rights of full citizenship. This is a very important point because most black folks run around with their heads down. Like, you know, we act, a lot of us act like, well, we are kind of kind of borrowing some stuff and borrowing time, but we pay fully into the system. You know, we don't have any degraded tax thing. You know, whatever you make, you pay just like you, you know, you pay taxes just like everybody else. We get exploited just like everybody So we have... Uh, we have, uh, I, I know you're going to do that. That's why I was trying to rush. Didn't you see me doing that? Yeah. <laughs> now you may be, you may be wasting <laughs> seconds. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so yeah, so we should enjoy equal protection in the law as well as equal opportunity in education, uh, equal, equal opportunity in, in, employment, in the uh, employment arena. So the reason where I'm going, folks, is that the Trayvon Martin case is upon us because black folks are still suspect and don't enjoy the full protection and security of the United States government, which they're citizens of. So next I uh, want to introduce Rose Brewer. She's um, a longtime community and political activist. Thank you. There you go. Uh, <laughs> as well as a professor. Um, the Af African American Studies Department and the African Studies Department That's at right. the University of Minnesota. So please welcome Rose. Thanks, Ty. Um, it's good to be here. Um, and I wasn't at um, the mobilization. And that's what it was, a, a mobilization. And as Mel says, uh, we've seen lots of mobilizations. Many of you probably remember the Gen 6 and uh, the amount of... Uh, at least numerical energy that was put into that mobilization. Um, when um, Amadou Diallo was uh, killed in New York City, shot 41 times by New York police, a um, lot of mobilization. And um, we're at a, I would say, a very defining moment in that uh, mobilizations simply aren't enough. Uh, this is, in fact, a uh, uh, a movement building uh, period and I would like to see uh, hundreds of these conversations happening. I'm glad it's happening here at May Day but one of the ways that I think we're going to move this process forward is that we're going to have to pull a lot more people into understanding what we're dealing with. Uh, I think there is some degree of confusion. I'm very glad uh, Mel articulated um, a citizen's perspective because uh, we don't understand too often what citizenship means. And I think uh, for a very long time, as he suggested, uh, the face of racism in this country has been interred in state violence. Uh, I'm going to use that term. And state violence has always been an arm of uh, the police. And the police have carried out state uh, violence 
in the name of uh, the U.S. government, both domestically and globally. That's what war and imperialism represents. So I think we should be very clear about how these systems work in relationship uh, to one another. I don't have to tell you all how repeatedly uh, some communities are patrolled, police, and this goes back to the very, very early uh, history of this country. Uh, some of you may have heard the news today where uh, there were uh, immigrant sweeps all over the U.S. I think over 5,000 people were gathered up and uh, about 56 or more right here in the state of Minnesota. You may not know, or you may, uh, given this, this group, that uh, the Department of Homeland Security has given over $19 million to police organizations here in the U.S to collaborate on training and surveillance. Uh, this includes private uh, security officers and wannabe mm. <laughs> security folk, uh, a la uh, Zimmerman. And, you know, a lot of this has been on the policing and surveillance uh, given 9-11 of the Islamic Muslim population. But these methods were practiced for a very long time on our communities, on black and brown communities. So they don't really have to reinvent the wheel. It's sort of old wine in new bottles. And some of us remember COINTELPRO and the strategies that were used under that kind of state surveillance. And it, it certainly hasn't gone away. I think a lot of it is uh, justified, articulated through the lens that Mel laid out. And that, that's a lens of a narrative around black criminality about the fact, especially black men are crafted as criminals and black women are crafted as whores. So, you know, that doesn't demand on either account uh, any kind of respect. And so when you have something like Stand Your Ground, which actually almost got passed right here in Minnesota, a version of it, uh, I think Dayton vetoed it, uh, but in over 21 states, uh, what it does is give license to white vigilantism because the crafting of the image of who is criminal allows that and 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 you know we can follow this narrative because it, it has played out so directly in uh, the Zimmerman case and let's not forget that that also connects to a very long history where under racial apartheid uh, the citizens councils were the business face of white supremacy but the Klan was quite connected as the vulgar, aggressive face of it. And that went all the way up through uh, the sheriff's departments, the uh, state patrols, to the very site of state government. So uh, the idea that uh, the police and the state have always been intimately connected is something that we should be very clear about. I also think that... Uh, while the mobilization is imperative and important and it's moved the process along in a way that probably wouldn't have been moved along without many folks standing up, uh, we do need theory and practice. We need to understand what's the context in which this is happening. Uh, what's the nature of late capitalism in this context? What connects at this point in time all the rhetoric around colorblindness, which we know isn't true, to the deeply rooted, institutionalized white supremacy that has never been swept away. And, you know, white supremacy really isn't about a white person. It's about a set of practices, a mindset. That's the reason a Zimmerman, who ostensibly, and the press doesn't ever get this right, is ostensibly maybe of some kind of inherent, uh, you know, Latino heritage, doesn't see himself that way. Right. And in fact, um, some of the data that I saw indicate that about 53% of the Hispanic, and I hate that word, I know many Latino people don't like that term, uh, if you ask them to check the box, will check white. So there is a kind of narrative and mindset that allows under these conditions of uh, white supremacy, someone who ostensibly should be in alignment with uh, black and other brown people who sees themselves mm -hmm. against that alignment. Right, and, cool. you know, ideologically it's played out over and over and over through every image that's exposed, through the newspaper, through the press, 
and this kind of profound uh, manipulation of our consciousness. You have to be very, very attuned to it because it's naturalized. You know, you don't even think about it. And, you know, I, I think sometimes those of us who, quote, are on the left or however you want to define yourself as revolutionary, however, uh, presume that identity is a backward kind of a set of understandings, mm -hmm. but the right understands that yes, it's through identity right. Right. that they manipulate, uh, that they very well understand how the use of identity, and they use it very much to their own interests. Uh, the fact that there's a 1% that uh, has most of the resources of the earth, uh, who is that 1%? Well, disproportionately, it's uh, a global white male elite in, embodied in corporations and not completely anymore. I mean, there are folk from uh, the third world who benefit just a little bit. Uh, but we have to understand how these systems work together and not to get real nervous about the fact that identity is used very strategically in the context of uh, what I call neoliberal capitalism. So we're in a trans-capitalist moment. Uh, it is in crises. But this cultural trope is very powerful, and that's the form that it takes. And we should be very, very clear about how those things connect one with the other. Um, I have just a couple of more things that I can say. This time goes fast, doesn't it? He's signaling me already. I know, because, you know, it's, it's go ahead, conversation. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I guess really where I want to go is, um, you know, uh, there, there are a number of things that we, in addition to understanding how uh, this neoliberal moment of privatization and so-called uh, uh, individual responsibility, the three of us were involved in the, the struggle around North High and the way that uh, public schools are being decimated. That's a part of this neoliberal uh, agenda. But we know, uh, a la uh, the new Jim Crow, that the ugliest face of uh, neoliberal white supremacist uh, capitalism is through this prison industrial uh, through a system that right now uh, has uh, millions of people uh, in it. Uh, they may not be in the jail or under the jail, but they've had contact with it. And we know who those folk are. Uh, over half of them are, are black men and increasingly uh, black women are uh, uh, a growing segment of that population uh, with little recognition of reproductive rights, uh, women being shackled as they're about to give birth. Uh, there was a case just recently. So uh, this kind of patriarchy, sexism, connects with uh, this system in a way that uh, we should be very aware of. So um, just sort of drawing from uh, some of the work that some of the uh, legal people in the critical race arena have said. Um, I'll just quote from one of uh, their writings. Um, they point out that racial power was not simply or even primarily a product of biased decision making on the part of judges, but instead the sum total of the pervasive ways in which the law shapes and is shaped by race across the social plane. Laws produce racial power not simply through narrowing the scope of, say, anti-discrimination remedies, nor through racially-based decision-making, but instead through uh, a my myriad of legal rules, a la stand your ground, uh, many of them having nothing to do with the rules against right. discrimination, but that, con that continue to reproduce the structures and practices of racial domination. And if uh, you all haven't uh, read Angela Davis's stuff on, um, on, on prisons, it's a good parallel to Michelle Alexander, where she lays out uh, the absolute interconnectedness of uh, this system with uh, global war and militarism and incarceration in this country. So, you know, the call for us is clear. Um, the struggle for change is not simple nor easy, never has been, never will be, a la Frederick Douglass. And it's our challenge to organize, to build, and to be very clear, both in terms of action and theory, uh, what we're up against. So I know my time is up. Thank you. So, um, I mean, as we've seen from, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to sort of give a few comments about you know how this movement can be built um, more fully. My name is Ty uh, Moore, I'm a socialist alternative for those who came in late. You know, I think it's clear Trayvon's murder did not happen in a vacuum, as we've seen. And George Zimmerman can't be looked at as sort of a lone racist vigilante, um, as Mel said, just one bad apple in an otherwise healthy tree. That, you know, we can't truly understand what this murder was about, or what the, on the other hand, what the mass popular anger that this murder has provoked is about, without looking at the root cause of racism in U.S. capitalism, which... I think Mel and Rose have done a good job of laying out. You know, as I, I often say, you know, like a like a doctor, if you don't accurately diagnose the disease, right. you're not going to be able to prescribe, you know, a remedy, a cure. And that's the same thing about social problems. If you, you know, think, well, it's just an education problem. You know, it's just we got some miseducated white people or miseducated, you know, etc. Um, that's the issue. Or if we just populated the halls of power with a few more diverse faces that suddenly, you know, that will change the conditions for ordinary people. Well, those sorts of analysis will lead you to very different conclusions about what the solution is than if you say, as we do, that racism um, and the violence that, you know, comes along with that is structurally built into U.S. capitalism. is a necessary feature to maintain the, the overall power structure that exists to maintain the profits of the 1%. You know, Frederick Douglass, uh, I'll give another Frederick Douglass quote, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, famous abolitionist, said, you know, that society's masters, quote, secured their ascendancy over both poor whites and blacks by putting enmity, enmity between them. They divided both to conquer each. And I think, you know, while, of course, we, we, we you know, to fight for class unity, we have to recognize the special oppression uh, that you know is is meted out to uh, people of color, particularly African Americans in this country. We have to recognize as part of a greater strategy of class rule that has been developed specifically in the U.S. through the legacy of racism um, and you know the the waves of immigration um, that has developed a peculiar form of racism that is unique to the U.S. And Mel uh, did a good job of laying out laying out some of that stuff. I think many progressive people, you know, hoped that the symbolic effect of electing the first black president would, you know, really be a transformative moment in this country. And, and of course, you know, while, you know, many on the left warned and were critical that Obama, you know, was heavily funded by Wall Street, et cetera, it, it was an important moment. It did, it was a certain, you know, milestone that, you know, sort of cracked a certain glass ceiling that had existed previously. But there was a lot of hopes attached to that, that that were and have been proven now to be unfounded. That fundamentally it did not really change the sort of structural setup of U.S. society. Um, you know, and so the idea that, that many sort of conservative theorists that we now live in this post-racial society um, that was, I think, you know, given credence by some by Obama's election is, you know, I think been eroded away over the last several years of people have sort of seen the results of Obama in power has not really changed that much in terms of the lives of ordinary, you know, people of all races, but in, especially African Americans. Um, and I think this Trayvon Martin murder and the impact that it has had, you know, on consciousness has really shattered that illusion. Um, and I think we're going to see, you know, a much a great, a better uh, discussion open up in the coming period of what sort of, if, if electing a black president doesn't resolve racism in this country, you know, what are the structural issues? Um, in fact, over the last several years since the election of Obama, not because of Obama, but as a result of the economic crisis that Wall Street and many of Obama's backers were responsible for, the situation has gotten much worse. You know, if you look at virtually any economic indicator, from unemployment statistics to how the housing crisis has disproportionately affected African American communities, to, you know, the continued, uh, you know, uh, racism in the criminal justice system and disproportionate incarceration of people of color, etc. You know, all those problems have only deepened under the impact of economic crisis. But worse, and this gets to the sort of character of a, of a, of a George Zimmerman type, we've seen a meteoric rise 
in far-right organizations and openly racist rhetoric, even in the mainstream political establishment with figures like Santorum, you know, uh, uh, spacing the quote that has been widely circulated now, but where he, he, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the one about the black people, he just inserted in the speech that we're not going to give them. Uh, oh, right, yeah. right. You know, it's taxpayers not, shouldn't be. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Anyway, right. no, I know which one but we you're see talking about, Ty. You're talking about the one where he called them that he didn't. Are you talking about that quote? There's a lot of terrible quotes. We see, we, see, uh, we, see Gingrich, we see Gingrich calling Obama the welfare president with, uh, you know, uh, you know, clear racial undertones that are that are going on. And this is, of course, deep in the tradition of of U.S. society, um, but had been pushed back for a certain period. But we're seeing the reemergence of these kind of far right groups um, in the context of the crisis. And that's not abnormal. In fact, it's an international phenomenon and it's a consistent historical pattern. Every time capitalism has moved deeper into economic crisis, producing social and economic anxieties amongst ordinary people, the ruling elite have to answer a basic question. They have to, people are asking, what's wrong? Where's the problem? Why are my, you know, why is, are things falling apart in my communities and my neighborhoods? Why are my jobs being lost? Why are my social services being defunded? And, you know, the answer we would give is, well, it's because the nature of capitalism is inherently unstable, because the 1%, the, the, the elite are hoarding things, because they're trying to profit off of the immiseration of the majority, um, and because that's how society is set up. But of course, those who are benefiting from that, who control the media, who control most of the political institutions, they don't want to give that answer, so they have to give other answers. And their answers are to push to the forefront Tea Party, uh, types, you know, neighborhood watch types who point the finger in a scapegoating fashion and say, you know, the jobs are being taken by the immigrants. They don't point the finger at Wall Street who's doing the layoffs, they point the finger at the immigrants who say, you know, the problems in our communities is not because of mass unemployment is causing economic desperation and therefore crime is inevitable, but because, you know, there must be something wrong with these people over here, or those people over there to commit these crimes. And, and the media, you know, plays up the story even in defiance of you know statistics that you know show that you know, there's not any great racialization of crime in reality, um, there's there's crime attached to poverty. So you know we see a situation where, in reality, the U.S. remains the leading jailer in the world with more of its population behind bars in proportion and and in absolute numbers than any other country in the world and any other country in history outside of wartime. Um, the number of Incarcerated African Americans is a scandal within this scandal. As of the middle of 2009, there were 2.3 million people in state, federal, or local prisons, according to federal statistics. And almost a million of them were African American, 40%, more than three times the percentage of uh, blacks in the population. The U.S. justice system really is a machine of, of, of racist victimization, and especially targeting young black men. According to the Sentencing Project, African Americans who are 13% of the population um, and 14% of drug users uh, account for 37% of people arrested on drug charges and 56% of those serving time in state and prisons for drug offenses. As a result of these disparities, the government calculated the odds of a black man born in 2001 going to prison during their lifetime is 1 in 3 compared to 1 in 17 for white males. So we see, you know, that is not disconnected from what happened with Trayvon. You know, while you know, it wasn't a police in this case that shot him down, the you know, racism of the criminal justice system has been exposed, continues to be exposed, in the inaction of the local to police department in their you know, sort of assumption that you know, innocent, uh, well, you know, whatever, their assumption of, of just taking Zimmerman's word at face value, of protecting him because of his family connections, and because you know the the history of racism in that community and across the U.S., so I just want to end by putting out some thoughts on what kind of movement we need to effectively fight back against racism, violence, and police abuse in this country. The movement we've seen so far in defense of Trayvon has been magnificent. We had, I think, you know, the stars aligned in a certain way, and we had the largest, I think, the largest rally outside of Florida so far here in Minneapolis with 5,500 people. Um, last Saturday. It was a tremendous, uh, I think, really excellent event, you know, despite some of the limitations, I agree with Mel, of the, 
of the lack of sort of a coherent direction that came from the speaker's stage. I think the mood of ordinary people, and the huge turnout reflects, you know, a very good politicization. But it also exposes the weakness of the left and the civil rights leadership today, this national movement. The real vacuum of leadership, of clear ideas and how to channel this massive anger into, you know, an ongoing mass movement for social change. You know, since I've been alive in politics, uh, you know, since the mid-1990s, as has been mentioned, there's been, you know, numerous cases that bring waves of protest, and then it recedes again, and, and business as usual proceeds. But I don't think that's inevitable. I think that, you know, has a lot to do with leadership. Um, the reality is that, you know, the national leadership coming out that's, that's aligned with the Democratic Party for the most part, figures like... Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson, who could speak very articulately to some of the problems. Mm -hmm. But what happens when the civil rights movement that has been substantially co-opted into the Democratic Party is that there becomes a tremendous pressure placed on those leaders of, of, you know, of, of all communities. You can say this in the trade unions, the women's rights movement, but certainly it's true in the civil rights movement. Um, not to put forward demands, not to put forward solutions, that challenge the leadership of the Democratic Party, i.e. that challenge the corporate funders of that leadership, that challenge Wall Street, that challenge big business. What that means is while, yes, we can say, you know, prosecute George Zimmerman, we heard that at the rally, we can talk about ending this, you know, this crazy stand your ground law, but the real deeper going solutions of fundamental changes to the criminal justice system, of community, genuine democratic community control of the police, and the ability for the community to recall um, continuous abuses, and of more deeply going, solving problems like unemployment, poverty, lack of housing, uh, inequality in school funding, the deep going economic and structural racism that exists in all, these, in all these areas of social and economic life, that fundamentally answering those questions is the answer. And the way that that can be achieved, I think, is building a broad-based movement that doesn't just say, you know, stop racist violence, but says, we're going to fight against the fundamental, the deep-going uh, root causes of these uh, attitudes in society. It's not just a matter of calling out racists. It's a matter of saying, no, you're wrong about the root cause of your social instability, and we, as a social movement, have answers to that, of taxing big business, of providing social programs. So... Um, all in with that, also not to abuse the time.